yes, we can hear you well. Perfect, Allah. Very good, very good. Uh, thanks again. So welcome everyone uh, to the Global Protection Cluster Annual Forum 2020. I am very glad, uh, glad to see today uh, many colleagues I recognize, even more glad to see many colleagues I, I don't recognize. It does mean that the reach on this important topic uh, goes as much have as well on the partners uh, beyond uh, the traditional protection partners, and that is great. The 2020 Global Forum is, uh, as you have seen in the brochure for this event, is jointly hosted by the GPC Strategic Advisory Group, uh, the Child Protection, Gender-Based Violence, Housing, Land and Property, and Mine Action Areas of Responsibility of the Global Protection Cluster, but also with many specialized agencies uh, that work with us on general protection issues, including uh, this important topic. The forum for uh, those of you who haven't attended previous sessions is, is split into three segments. Uh, the first one is technical in nature uh, and is designed specifically for field coordinators uh, that are working on uh, in the national and subnational protection clusters and areas of responsibilities. But we also have uh, as a second uh, type, the thematic segment and uh, today's session is one of them. And these are important topics that we would like to engage as much uh, the cluster coordinators and uh, at national level, but also the wider uh, protection community. And third and finally, at the end of the year, we will have a high level segment to really push some of the priorities that we hear during the sessions this year, uh, including today's session, uh, to, uh, to actually uh, push the member states and partners to, to focus, focus on that. So today's event is on protecting victims of trafficking. Uh, the global estimates of trafficking in person indicate that millions of people are victimized worldwide. In crisis countries, crisis affected populations are acutely and uh, vulnerable to this crime. Trafficking in persons is a, is a humanitarian protection concern. It's a crime and abuse that violates the dignity and integrity of the person and endangers their, their life, their community, their physical security. Importantly, global data shows that 60% of the trafficking victims are exploited within their own country. I repeat, 60% of the trafficking victims are exploited within their own country. While this is evident for specialists and practitioners that work on trafficking issues, it's important to dissociate this concept that, or perception that trafficking involves this crossing the border concept to the reality where we see the majority of people trafficked within their own country. It's therefore essential that the humanitarian and protection community respond to trafficking from the outset and throughout the operations and de facto in a preventive way before the crisis starts. The global protection cluster uh, is committed to embedding anti-trafficking action into protection response. We're committed to make it systematic. We're committed to make it accountable. We're more committed to make it commensurate to the size of the crime. We have commenced collecting data on trafficking risks in the 26 countries where the protection clusters are active. This is published in our situation reports. We will use, and we started using this data to advocate, to strengthen the response, and to really become smarter in the program design and how we complement uh, the work that is done on the ground. We have also established the Global Protection Cluster Task Team on Anti-Trafficking that brings together basically specialists and expert organization who have programs on the ground to come together to bolster the, the, the response in itself, but also the coordination. Trafficking is one of these notorious crimes that requires a 
that addressing it requires really relying on local actors. And this is important in this time and age where the localization concept is, is so important. The working on trafficking really needs us to, as international organization, to walk the talk on localization. Otherwise, we have no chance of seriously addressing this crime. But beyond localization, also this crime is a, is a typical crime that requires peace, humanitarian, human rights, and development actors to come together to address it. The scale and complexity of the crime is also, again, in this time and age, a typical example where we stand no chance of seriously addressing it if we don't have this, this concept of a nexus coming together in practice to address it. So as you see, we have a lot to learn. Trafficking is a complex phenomenon requiring this holistic response. We depend on everyone to come together and us helping those actors in the front lines that are doing the job. So I thank you all for joining us today. We continue our commitment to understanding and responding this trafficking in crisis. And I'm looking forward to hear from you, learn from you, and sharpen our ideas on how to better support all your organizations on the front lines. Thank you so much, Sam. Back to you. Thanks so much for that introductory remarks, William. Great to hear from you. Um, attendees, we're very lucky today to also have the new Special Rapporteur on Trafficking in Persons, um, Ms Siobhan Malali, join us today. And so I've asked her to kindly take the floor and share some opening remarks with us. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon and uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak today. I'm delighted to join this session and to be part of this work. Um, as many of you will know, uh, my predecessor Maria Grazia Jamarinaro had undertaken significant work in making the links between human trafficking, trafficking in persons and peace and conflict uh, situations and had worked in particular to try to break down the different kinds of silos that arise uh, in responding to situations of crisis to ensure that a response to human trafficking is comprehensive uh, and effective. Um, I hope to continue that work, um, to continue building on those uh, foundations that have been set in terms of working in peace and conflict settings, but more broadly working in humanitarian settings to raise awareness around the roles of different actors um, in humanitarian settings, whether it's refugee protection, um, IDP settings, or other situations where there are heightened risks of trafficking in persons due to increased vulnerability arising from displacement, loss of shelter, loss of employment, uh, or other disruptions, perhaps ongoing conflict also. And as was said, uh, conflict settings uh, may give rise to increased risks of human trafficking, uh, but it's not always across borders. It can be and is increasingly within states, within jurisdictions, within regions, and different kinds of networks may be involved. Sometimes highly organized criminal networks linked to um, armed groups, uh, some, but sometimes much more informal um, networks of families, communities, um, sometimes links with the state itself. And these pose particular challenges. Um, and I think the, the work of the Global Protection Cluster um, will be to identify the roles of all humanitarian actors and the specific responsibilities in humanitarian settings. Um, to look at protection issues from a very early stage. So some responsibilities in relation to identification of victims or potential victims, um, referral for protection, um, ensuring that there is effective access to specialized services and supports, um, but also ensuring that uh, prevention measures are taken very early on uh, so that we don't get to the point of responding to this serious human rights violation, trying to ensure coordination between different actors 
um, to prevent the occurrence of human trafficking. And where it does occur, uh, ensuring that everybody is ready um, to uh, bring about a situation where there is accountability, that we can combat impunity for this crime and serious violation. I think the key thing that I want to say is that this uh, has often been looked at as a criminal justice concern and criminal justice issue, sometimes as an issue around migration control, um, but really it's a very hu serious human rights uh, concern and that the need for that human rights based approach and response has been emphasised again in the renewal of my mandate, in the resolution adopted at the Security Council, at the Human Rights Council and other resolutions adopted at the Security Council specifically on trafficking in persons, um, that this is a serious human rights violation and requires coordination between different actors. So I look forward to listening to the contributions this afternoon and to continuing to working with the Global Protection Cluster. Thank you. Many thanks, Siobhan. Um, we certainly have our hands full in the anti-trafficking response in humanitarian settings. There's, we know there's a lot of work to come, um, but we're very grateful for your support and we hope to work really closely with you throughout your mandate over the next three years. Um, thank you so much to all of the participants for joining in today. As you can see, we have a bit of a jam-packed session. And as William and Siobhan both alluded to, a holistic trafficking response involves so many components and not just a criminal element. We really need to focus on the protection response and considering the social and economic aspects of this phenomenon. So before we get into the um, meat of today's session, I'll just go through a few housekeeping details for everyone so we're on the same page. Um, for those of you who may not have noticed so far, we have simultaneous translation into Spanish. Uh, we have one speaker today who will be presenting in Spanish, um, and so the translator will come on board there. Please, um, you can see in the Zoom panel there when you need to switch the translation. We'll also be recording this session. So if anyone wants to come back and listen to us again, we will be publishing the link on the Global Protection Cluster website. I think something Renata and I have noticed before uh, in previous Global Protection Cluster annual forums it's that sometimes we give voice to what's happening at the global level uh, and don't hear as much about what's happening in the field. So in today's session, we have invited four panelists who are working on the anti-trafficking response in various ways to present to us today. And we really wanted to take a step back and really amplify those voices I think what we can hear from everyone is there is still so much to learn in what an effective anti-trafficking response looks like in a humanitarian setting. So we're very lucky today to have Andrea, who is from IOM, she's a counter-trafficking specialist, um, and she's also one of the co-leads of the Global Protection Cluster Task Team on anti-trafficking. And she'll be running through with us the basics, what is trafficking, dispelling some of the myths, and also helping us understand how trafficking is integrated into the protection work we do. We then have Lily, who is also a counter-trafficking expert, who has been the trafficking project director in Northeast Nigeria. We then have Gilberto from UNODC Colombia, who's going to be speaking to us about how to strengthen institutions in the anti-trafficking response. We're then lucky to have Irina from IOM Ukraine, who is going to speak to us a little bit about how to gather data on trafficking, which we know is really critical and something that a lot of people say, we don't know how to even start to respond to trafficking because we don't have the data. So really looking forward to hearing from Irina. And then finally, we have Estiana from Venezuela, 
who is going to be speaking to us about how they actually manage cases, how they identify, refer and assist victims of trafficking. But to kick us off, I'll pass you to my wonderful colleague, Renata, uh, who is an anti-trafficking specialist and secretariat of the Global Protection Cluster task team on anti-trafficking. And you have to introduce yourself. Oh, yes, sorry everyone. <laughs> for those of you who don't know me, I'm Sam McCormack. I am the focal point for anti-trafficking in the Global Protection Cluster. If you ever want to reach out, my email is in the concept note for this event where you registered. Um, so please feel free to get in touch after the session if you need to follow up with anything. Over to you, Renata. Thank you. I mean, in a way, I think William and Siobhan have made my life a lot easier because here, if I can change my slide. Yes. Um, I wanted to talk to you all a little bit about the anti-trafficking task team. And we have existed since 2017, and it has been a really nice journey so far, I would say. Um, as William was saying, and Siobhan also alluded to, over the past few years, there have been a lot of Security Council resolutions, Human Rights Council resolutions, and saying that we have to respond to anti-trafficking also in the humanitarian context, as we've done for this 20 years, as mm. the convention is starting this year, in development context. So these three organizations, Heartland Alliance International, UNHCR, and IOM, got together and established this team within the protection cluster to make sure that we integrate anti-trafficking into mm. the protection programming. Um, the key word here is integrating. We don't want to create something completely new, given that anti-trafficking programming has a lot of commonalities with the protection programming. And Andrew is going to talk more about this in a little bit. In this three years that we have existed, we've done the stock taking to understand a little bit how is trafficking being coordinated uh, and anti-trafficking programs being implemented in the places where the protection cluster is active. We have done a couple of awareness raising through webinars to colleagues from the GBV and child protection areas of responsibility. We've also done a couple of capacity building trainings in which we've gone, gone to a couple of places, some, some operations, to share some guidance and knowledge on how to implement anti-trafficking programs. And in all of these discussions, I think what we've been getting a lot is, you know, we need a guidance, we need to know more. How, how can we get more information about this? How can we respond? Because as Siobhan alluded to, it is the duty that all protection actors, and I would say all humanitarian actors, have to prevent people from being trafficked, identify and refer persons to the appropriate services, and protect and assist victims of trafficking. And I feel like I've just said the same mm. words as Siobhan. Um, and this is where we come to. So we've been working over the past year, Sam. Yeah. yeah. So based on these exchanges that we've had with practitioners at the field, with our protection colleagues, what is the content that is most useful to you to understand trafficking and integrate trafficking into your work? Um, so the guidance has four key areas and will cover understanding trafficking in persons and the roles of responders, because I think that's one of the areas we got a lot of questions when we had our different trainings. Um, preventing and protecting uh, trafficked persons, how to identify, refer and manage cases. I think that's also an area that we get a lot mm -hmm. of questions about. And of course, as we know, the humanitarian sector at large has been moving into evidence-based programming. So we have a small section talking about collecting data on anti-trafficking to inform your program. That is coming really soon, and we are very excited for it. Um, yeah, and now we go into the interesting part of the program to hear from your, our colleagues. So Andrea, over to you. Ready? Yeah. Great. Uh, really quick thing. Do I request remote control of this? Yeah. Okay. 
Got it. Okay, so 10 minutes is uh, not a lot of time to cover a lot of ground. So I'm going to jump right into it. Let me see. Is this, uh, if I click it, I'll put this diagram up right out right away. Many of you have seen something like this before. So um, a lot of you might already be pretty familiar with the definition of human trafficking. Uh, there may be some of you who, who know some of the key elements that are listed that are here on the, on the screen, but maybe are not completely sure of how this presents in practice. What does um, human trafficking actually look like when you have a case in front of you in an IDP site, in, a, in an acute crisis? Um, and for some of you, this might still be a little bit of a new topic. So normally in trainings, we go into the technical definition of trafficking um, quite extensively in a lot of detail. We won't do that today. There isn't time, but uh, there are resources we can share, such as the upcoming guidance. Um, you can always reach out to the anti-trafficking task team directly and or you can contact us probably through the Global Protection Clusters Community of Practice to have a conversation there as well. All right, next. So to back it up a little bit, uh, a slightly more simplified way to consider trafficking in persons or TIP as we often call it, is that uh, it is a human rights violation. That's pretty straightforward. Um, trafficking, uh, a case of trafficking can violate a number of human rights and therefore it is a protection concern. This could be um, a right to life, right to freedom of movement, a right to adequate living or working conditions, as a couple of examples. Uh, trafficking in persons is a crime. Uh, this was already mentioned by William quite a bit. So according to the UN Convention on Transnational Organized Crime, under which we get the the definition. Um, it is a crime and more and more countries are also establishing national laws that criminalize human trafficking specifically. And it is a form, come on, a form of exploitation. So there are many forms of exploitation and trafficking in persons is one of those. So it is important to remember that uh, people can be exploited. Um, it doesn't automatically mean they are a victim of trafficking we will come back to, to exploitation in just a moment because it can be a little bit complicated. So this is an easy way to consider trafficking without getting into the very legal technical definition. So on that note, do you have to be an expert in trafficking to be able to, to work on this, can, to be able to identify possible cases in uh, IDP settings or any humanitarian setting? Do you have to be a lawyer? Do you have to be a trained social worker? The short answer is no, not exactly. So most of us who work in protection on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, we don't need to be experts to be able to recognize some of the warning signs or potential rights abuses. Um, through our day-to-day, -day, I'll list some things here, basically through your regular protection monitoring, discussions with families, community members, in cluster meetings, um, including intercluster coordination meetings, um, just day-to-day -day interaction, and any um, further to what's listed here, discussions with, um, I would say health workers too, but I guess that's here. Um, you can be alerted to situations that could amount to trafficking, or cases might be referred directly to you as a protection actor and then in those cases, a decision has to be made. It depends on your situation. Um, if we have the, the resources to handle the next steps directly, whatever that will be, um, or if we find another organization or group or subcluster or AOR who does have the capacity to take it forward from a more um, expert uh, standpoint, you could say. So, when do you need to have a little bit more expertise in anti-trafficking as a protection actor? If we are doing things like training or advising law enforcement or a judiciary, um, training civil society or social workers, um, if we are planning to report violations, and by reporting violations that could mean giving inputs to a, a report for the Secretary General on various topics such as conflict-related sexual violence, um, children in an armed conflict, and also if you were to report or consider reporting 
a breach of conduct that we maybe we've witnessed or heard about, such as from security actors, peacekeepers, um, then we really have to know the definition. And most importantly, if you are required or you're going to be tasked with verifying or confirming a case of human trafficking through an interview, then you have to know this definition very well. And this type of um, verification should also be considered when you're doing best interest determination or assessments for children, uh, when there is separated or un unaccompanied to separated minors and you're looking at potentially um, facilitating family reunification. And also if you're advocating on behalf of a beneficiary who maybe is in trouble somehow with the law, there are occasionally provisions of not being criminalized if they were trafficked, I won't get into that now, but there's a, there's a few more sticky points um, with the technical definition. And as well, I know we're talking about IDP context, but just to keep in mind, um, it would affect a person's uh, claim for asylum too, different context. So back to the main definition of act, means, and purpose. Quite simply, the act is what is done, the means, how it is done, and the purpose is always exploitation. So sometimes people want to argue that the purpose is for profit or money, and that's a logical argument, often it is, but for, from the perspective of a, from a pure definition sense, the purpose is always exploitation. Now, the question is, what is exploitation? This is not really defined very well anywhere. There's no pure consensus on what it means. Um, and it can be defined a bit differently in different countries. So some countries have a very clear list of ex exploitation can mean these five things. Other countries will follow something a little more open-ended, which allows um, the definition to accommodate different types of trafficking as, as they arise, as we discover them. So generally speaking, the internationally recognized definition of trafficking under the Palermo Protocol lists exploitation as this. It has um, exploitation of prostitution of others, other forms of sexual exploitation, forced labor or services, slavery or practices similar to slavery, and that might sound a bit um, obscure to some people as well, servitude or the removal of organs. But this is still left a little bit open-ended. Now, one more important thing to remember to have a basic knowledge of what trafficking is, is that for child trafficking, um, the means, the middle piece, is not necessary. So that's taken out entirely for a case to count as um, child trafficking. Only the act for the purpose of exploitation is required. Okay, so now let me see, I've got almost seven minutes. Okay, so let's, um, we'll practice a little bit. I don't know if there's time or space to do, like for people to answer in the, in the comments, no pressure, I'll just run through these. I've got a few examples, uh, a few scenarios to help illustrate um, what, what it might look like in practice. So I'll read it a little bit faster. A group of men in an IDP site have organized young women from a different quadrant of the site who they coerce into prostitution. The men keep the money from the customers and they give nothing or very little to the women. The women stay because they are afraid to leave, they have nowhere to go, and now they face shame of the community if they report this abuse. So, of course, you don't have all the information. There's a lot of questions still to be asked. But just with this snapshot, does this start to look like, could this be trafficking? Can you see the act, means, and purpose somewhere in this small description? In the interest of time, I will jump forward. Yes, people say yes. Okay, great, people are answering. Um, yes, so organized, right off the bat, there is most likely that's the act, which is um, probably more like recruitment. Maybe, you're, maybe they also received or harbored the people, the women. Uh, coercion, that's the means, and the prostitution, that is the exploitation. So this sounds like probably, yes, this is trafficking. Maybe as you dig into more details, maybe other information would come forward, but at first glance, this would, this would probably count. This would warrant further discussion. Okay, next one. 
uh, a displaced family living in an urban setting is approached by a distant relative offering education opportunities to one of their children if they come to live with them in a nearby city. The child is sent with the relative, but instead of going to school, they are kept in poor conditions inside the house and are forced to work long hours as a domestic servant. So quickly, if anyone wants to answer, does this at first glance sound like trafficking? Yep, correct. It does. Again, this is all the information you have. We don't know everything yet. So what we see here is offering kind of like recruitment. That is the act. Uh, they're basically in domestic servitude, which is the purpose, the exploitation. And remember, because they're a child, it doesn't matter how they were tricked or deceived or, or forced into it for this to qualify. Okay, I'll do at least one or two more. Another example, a young man arrives at the health clinic in the camp and he explains he was taken to be a soldier in an armed group and recently defected, so he ran away. He said he was with the armed group for three years and he is maybe 18 or 19 years old now. And this is all you know. You don't know if he chose to join, well, it says he was taken, but. Um, what he did when he was in the armed group, we don't know yet. Was he involved in grave crimes? Um, so what do you think about this one? Does this sound like trafficking? At first glance, so again, this is all you know. Good, most likely, yes. So he was taken to be a soldier. I should have made the soldier red as well. So maybe abducted. Sorry, that's the means, hang on. We'll say recruited as the act. Um, what about the, the purpose? Well, he's a soldier in an armed group, which might not always be an immediate yes to trafficking, but consider this. He was a child when he was recruited, um, if you do the math here. Exactly, good answers. Probably forced to fight. He was a child when he started. Um, and arguably as well, when you recruit child soldiers, this is considered a, a, a worse form of child labor as well, which is considered trafficking. Okay, I'll do one more. Um, okay, during a massive flood, many families are displaced and separated. The devastation is massive and thousands of people are missing. An international child protection NGO arrives and registers unaccompanied and separated children to be adopted by families overseas and transports them away from the flooded region to a city with a functioning airport. Now, what do you think about this one? We know they're children. It's, it's mixed. It's a bit of a, these are good answers. It's, it's a tricky one. So let's look at for the elements. They've been transported. The means doesn't matter because they are children but is there exploitation is the question. Technically, um, technically, no, I mean, it's terrible. No question, this is illegal. This is for sure not, not right. It's unethical. It's a major child protection concern. Um, but the element of exploitation is not really there. We don't know if they're going to be taken for some other purpose. If they're really going to families, it's not right. But this is, it wouldn't count as trafficking. The reason I put this example in here is because this, this is actually quite a, a common occurrence, unfortunately. There have been some pretty famous cases that have happened during, uh, especially during natural disasters, such as the Haiti earthquake, um, during the tsunami in 2004, and years before that as well. There are stories of, of charities who come in and try to take children for adoption. Um, and it, it is often called trafficking, but this is technically, usually not correct so just be aware of that but it is still a massive protection concern absolutely and people are saying right now it could happen in lesbos yes um anywhere there's chaos separated children these these situations can happen i'm going to wrap it up because i'm at over my 10 minutes um but you can see it's not always perfectly clear um and i will hand this back over to my colleagues thank you angia Thanks so much, Andrea and colleagues. As you can tell, Renata and I have given 
our speakers very clear 10 minute time frame just so we can get through all of the speakers today. So without further ado, I will now hand over to Lily from Heartland Alliance, who will be speaking about coordinating a trafficking response with other actors in Nigeria. Over to you, Lily. Nini, you now have control of the screen. Okay, uh, hello, good afternoon and good morning, everyone. So I would put my presentation on then, right? Your presentation is already on. You just need to move next. Okay, okay, got it, got it, okay. Okay, so uh, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Lily and uh, until last month, I was uh, counter trafficking project director with uh, Heart and Alliance International in uh, Northeast Nigeria. So I would uh, present a case study on uh, Northeast Nigeria. So just a little bit about the context uh, because the um, as we are talking about trafficking in humanitarian settings or trafficking in crisis and trafficking in other contexts is different than trafficking in humanitarian settings and also the specific humanitarian crisis being a natural disaster or armed conflict impact the types of uh, trafficking occurring in the um, in the region so in northeast nigeria uh, we have the lake chad basin humanitarian crisis this is uh, the part in uh, west africa where the borders of niger nigeria chad and cameroon meet around uh, lake chad and it's also known with uh, violent conflict of uh, boko haram or um, lately islamic state boko haram and islamic state of west africa province where we talk about uh, uh, islamist groups opposing uh, Western education and also Western influence and being in an armed conflict with the Nigerian army or with the government. So it's a, a non-state armed opposition group uh, against the government. And then uh, this crisis uh, has been around since uh, 2009. It has affected more than 70 million people, displaced more than 2.5 million people, and uh, it's um, um, severe um, and very volatile safety and security situation and also a place where human trafficking uh, is common. And um, I just uh, wanted to highlight the types of trafficking in uh, Northeast Nigeria as trafficking in humanitarian crisis is different in, in than, than other contexts, even in Nigeria trafficking in the South and trafficking in the North where we have the conflict is quite different. So here we talk about armed conflict. The trafficking indirectly related to armed conflict um, because of the root causes are mostly poverty, uh, volatile safety and security situation. We have sexual exploitation, forced uh, uh, prostitution, forced marriage, forced labor, child trafficking, also forced marriage and child marriage, uh, uh, street uh, hawking and begging all by uh, children. Um, trafficking directly related to the conflict is with the uh, uh, participation of armed opposition group. So here we talked uh, relevant to uh, Andrea's example when we talk about abduction and forced recruitment of adults and children, adults, women being used for um, sexual exploitation, forced marriage, children being used for, uh, for labor or combatants, uh, child soldiers, and also suicide bombers. Then I'm just, okay, trying to move to the next slide. Um, my topic is coordination and cooperation in of um, um, humanitarian and national actors in the in humanitarian crisis where trafficking happens. Why, why is it uh, important? Uh, I want to go back to the previous slide. Okay. Okay, here we go. Because we have, uh, so what we have is a very heavy presence to multiple humanitarian actors, NGOs, INGOs, UN organizations. Nigeria has a very strong governmental sectors. Um, unlike or um, whereas many countries in, in this region have weak government, Nigeria's government and governmental institutions are very strong and they're very also uh, actively involved in the conflict. So here we have this heavy presence of actors. We also have trafficking as a cross-cutting and overarching issue. What, do, what does it mean? 
we have um, uh, we have uh, um, yes trafficking is a protection concern we know this it's a human rights violation but it's also a GBV issue because a lot of victims of trafficking are victims of GBV or SGBV it's a um, uh, child abuse concern so it's also concern of the child protection sector because of the child trafficking a lot of victims of trafficking victims and survivors of trafficking have uh, needs of uh, all, all of them of uh, mental health and psychosocial support assistance so we have all this sector that are responding to, to trafficking because victims and survivors have so many needs, so many services are, are needed to provide um, survivor center approach or, or victim center approach that there is a need for very well organized cooperation and coordination to have a successful response. And as the bigger picture, when we address the issue as a systemic change. How do we prevent trafficking at national level? Uh, how do we prosecute perpetrators? How do we provide holistic uh, support, protection, and reintegration to, to victims? So all this requires coordination and cooperation. So moving to the next slide. Uh, okay, I, I guess my screen is uh, a bit slow. Uh, because I want to go to the next one. Okay, so uh, successful example of coordination and cooperation in action. Uh, Following the model of the um, uh, GPC anti-trafficking task team in humanitarian action, uh, we founded anti-trafficking in persons task force in uh, Borno State, in Majuguri, Borno State. So this was initiative of IUM Heartland Alliance International and UNHCR. Again, um, similar to the, um, to the GPC anti-trafficking task team, where through this task force, we brought various stakeholders together to prevent, mitigate, and respond to trafficking in Northeast Nigeria, while capitalizing on each member specific um, expertise. And with this, we'd like to say that in ideal scenario, we'll see the four Ps in uh, um, the, the framework of um, addressing trafficking in a synchrony. So we have organization, NGOs, National Human Rights Commission, civil society organization focused on prevention efforts. We have uh, also uh, law enforcement, immigration, police. Uh, we also have the, the justice sector, uh, Ministry of Justice, National Bar Association, Nigerian Bar Association, working on prosecution efforts. We have the social service providers, Ministry of Women Affairs, Social Development. We have hospitals, we have social workers, we have psychologists, we have, um, uh, there are centers for providing assistance to victims who have suffered sexual exploitation and abuse, uh, shelters, they all ensure protection. And all of these actors work together in a partnership to, to address the issues through this coordination stru um, structure. And the structure is with the lead support organization, IUM, HEI, and UNHCR, co-chaired by National Agency for Prohibition Trafficking of Person and Ministry of Justice, and then organized around prevention, protection, and uh, prosecution subcommittees. So here we have the humanitarian actors in a situation of humanitarian crisis, and then we also have the national and uh, state governmental actors, as well as um, representatives from the sectors, different CSOs, INGOs, and, and so on. Uh, okay, so moving to the next. Okay, so I chose this slide just because it's a visual representation of the of the task force of um, what the um, the task force represent. So this picture, it's basically this um, coordination and and collaboration in action. So it's a scene from all the actors being in an IDP camp in Maiduguri. You see from the left, the folks for, from IUM with the blue shirts. You see the lady with the middle with the sunglasses is the director general of National Agency for Prohibition Trafficking in Persons. Then you see on the right side, the folks with the, the, um, the beige jacket. Those are the people from the uh, Nigerian government, from national and state agency. Uh, managing the crisis. So it's all actors coming together with their capacity and mandate to um, address trafficking. Um, then um, I'm moving to lessons learned. What, uh, what works, what doesn't, what, what did I learn, what I wish I knew. 
this work takes a lot of time. I mean, it really takes time to bring everyone on board, to, to win the agencies, to, to talk about trafficking as an issue. Because in the beginning, we, for, we had a lot of uh, a backlash. People were saying trafficking is not happening. Why do you need to do this? So it took a lot of time to go and meet with everyone, with state agency, governmental agency, the protection sector, to get the green light to institutionalize this coordinated response on trafficking. So it takes a lot of time. Um, since the, the, the time the trafficking uh, task force existed, half of the time has been only for preparation. It's very political because it's a human rights issue, it's a human rights violation. This human rights work is always political, but with trafficking especially, because it's a lucrative business. Um, uh, uh, as Andrea mentioned, it serves people in, in power. There are trafficking rings, there are, sometimes there are government involved. Because of the context also, the, the cultural religious context in a conservative society where, um, you know, we have uh, in Northeast Nigeria, Child Rights uh, Act is not, um, is not uh, ratified. So then we deal with issues with forced marriage, child marriage. We have the issue of sexual abuse and exploitation in camps where often the military is involved so it's very very political a good um, thing is that um, there is existing a legal framework uh, and also national agency for prohibition trafficking in persons i'm running over time but i'll finish by 11 minutes and uh, this is good because in in, uh, in many countries there isn't so in a way we have to prove that trafficking is an issue and existing while in nigeria we have the law to to you know, behind us to rely on the the, the law. Um, we have to work at all levels with grassroots communities, awareness raising, IDP camps, uh, host settings. Again, with 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 government, with with embassy. It's a working at all levels. We have to win the allies, we have to win the champions. Those are the people who are influential people in the government, in the civil society networks, the good people among the, um, you know, the, um, the, the institutions that could stand up and continue this initiative. Of course, we have to lead by example, doing the work, being passionate about the work, um, making it sustainable, meaning also not only making it humanitarian, but also including governmental and state institutions so that they could own the process, so that it's also their initiative. It's not something imposed by um, Western humanitarian organizations. And also to, we also within our organization, with humanitarian or organizations, there is a lot of turnover. So if we make it, okay, it's represented by, by Heartland, by IOM, by UNHCR, it's, it's, uh, it's represented by National Agency for Prohibition and Trafficking of Persons, Ministry of Justice, we are making it sustainable. And then there is more uh, opportunity for, for growth and development and uh, systemic change to address trafficking in persons. And uh, it's very, very uh, frustrating and difficult, but it's also very rewarding work when you see the results. Thank you very much. And I'm sorry for my technical difficulties. <laughs> no worries. Uh, I did something wrong. Um, I need to share my screen. Um, thank you, Lily. During your presentation, Sam and I were talking and we were just wondering for the colleagues that are with us in the room today, um, if you can let us know in the comments, uh, what is your experience on coordination with anti-trafficking? In your context, is it coordinated through the cluster? Is it does it have a working group? Or maybe there is no coordination at all. Uh, but do let us know on the chat. And with that, I will give the floor to my colleague, Gilberto from UNODC. Gilberto, the floor is yours. Hey, thank you so much. Um, so let me share my presentation. Okay, thank you so much. Um, uh, my name is Gilberto Zuleta. I'm the project coordinator in uh, the uh, program on trafficking in persons and smuggling of migrants in UNODC Colombia. Uh, according to uh, the, the objective of our, our participation in this space is to share some of our learn experience and lessons learned uh, from our work here. 
uh, specifically uh, in capacity building and supporting the rule of, uh, rule of law in all the national territory. Uh, my experience, I've been working in UDC for the last seven years, uh, the first five as a legal advisor, providing technical assistance in capacity building. And secondly, uh, the last two years, uh, as, as a project coordinator so of the team. It's a team composed by six uh, members, like six people, that uh, we are working uh, during the last two years, specifically in, in this capacity building uh, operation and activities with uh, different stakeholders. Mm, next, please. Hi, Gilberto. I think you have control of the screen. Yes, 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 yes. Okay, thank you. Sorry. Um, just a, a brief context about Colombia's situation and about the Colombian framework. Uh, no, nothing uh, to add uh, also, but uh, according to the definition that uh, Adriana uh, gave us about the, what is trafficking in persons according to the protocol to, to, of Palermo, uh, it's important to mention that in Colombia, uh, is not and, and no mean is required. No mean is required to have the, uh, the or, 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 or for the occurrence of the trafficking. Uh, that uh, means that uh, it doesn't matter if you are uh, under 18 or over 18, uh, uh, the mean is not required and is, uh, don't, don't have any relevance for the, um, for the occurrence of the crime. And it's also considered a uh, gender-based violence because of the different impacts that, uh, that uh, generate over the women, children, and other, other, other kind of population, even uh, LGBTI uh, people that uh, they are on, not only in the more vulnerable areas in Colombia, but also in the main cities or capitals that we have in the country. Our Colombian Constitutional Court, uh, in, a, in a judicial decision from 2011, uh, the, this court established that uh, being deprived of freedom for being detained or held against their own will impedes the enjoyment of other rights and liberties. In that sense, we have to mention that the trafficking in persons is a complex crime and is a human rights violation, especially in context of uh, violence, vulnerability, where gender-based stereotypes and discriminations uh, uh, are uh, uh, occurring in, in the context of territorial, uh, also in the borders, or uh, because of the armed conflict, uh, where uh, stereotypes and discrimination because of ethnicity or migration situation are stronger, uh, that allows that the uh, trafficking in persons is going to be um, most uh, heavy or more strong to occur in the, in the national or, or against the victims. In our national context, we have a, a law, a bill that is, uh, as you see in, in the presentation, we have the uh, 985 uh, from 2005 law. Um, this is the anti-trafficking uh, national law that provides all the uh, national architecture and provide uh, the definitions to, uh, to fight against this crime. And we have a national strategy uh, to combat the trafficking in persons. It's a national strategy that is in this moment is being reviewed and, and it's going to be uh, organized a new national strategy against trafficking in persons. And we have national committee. It's a national committee where, where the Ministry of Interior is in charge of have the secretariat from this national committee. And we have local committees in all of the territories, uh, the 32 uh, departments that we have in Colombia we have a local or regional uh, committees in charge of uh, the public policy at the local level uh, against uh, trafficking in persons. Uh, despite the peace agree agreement uh, signed with uh, the, the FARC, with the former government of, uh, of Colombia, uh, we have to recognize that uh, we have a, a transformation or a new dynamics of the armed conflict and situations of other uh, criminal manifestations in Colombia, specifically in the areas where we are uh, highlighted with the, uh, with the yellow point, uh, are, are areas where the risk have increased with uh, the deteriorated rule of law, involving armed conflict actors different than our others, uh, despite the FARC. Uh, we have ELN, ELN, we have other organized crime groups, and uh, 
different uh, criminal manifestations, such as uh, drug trafficking, Ill uh, illegal mining, other criminal uh, markets, uh, extractive markets, and people with need of humanitarian assistance, not only for the migration context that we are facing in South America and Latin America, but also because of the internal displacement, uh, because of the presence of these armed groups, and uh, also because of their even uh, natural disasters. According to the mandate of UNODC, we don't have a humanitarian mandate uh, or a humanitarian response to, for protection and assistance. We have to support, or our mandate is to support and promote implementation of the uh, UNTOC, you know, the Convention Against uh, Organized Crime, and its supplementary protocol to prevent, suppress, and punish trafficking in persons. Uh, that is the international framework for uh, to, to, to combat or to address the uh, trafficking persons here. Uh, so in that sense, our main um, response here is to design, enhance, and disseminate of strategies and tools to improve capacities for prevention, identification, assistance, prosecution, comprehension of the crime and the currents and cooperation with local and national authorities, especially where rule of law and institutional capacity and performance need to be strengthened. According to this, our main uh, activity here in the country is to provide technical assistance for the capacity buildings and the local strategies, for example, public policies and tools to identify uh, to prevent and to assist uh, victims of, of trafficking in persons. Um, and we need to recognize, it's this, this is really important for our work uh, here in Colombia, that uh, we, we work and uh, without them, it's impossible, or it, it, it has been impossible working here. We have worked and we work uh, with different uh, local NGOs to have presence in the most of the territory. For mention some of them, you can see Fundación Renacer, Espacios de Mujer, eh, Crecer, Apoyar, Progresar, especially in the border with Venezuela, eh, Marcela Loaiza Foundation. Eh, and eh, with the support of these NGOs, we can work and, and, and it's allowed to us uh, to go to the local level to work with the authorities and the stakeholders and to provide other assistance to the local level. Our response in, in, in the country, in Colombia, from UNODC, we can uh, categorize uh, in, in two parts. The first one is the institutional strengthening, and the second one is support to territorial authorities and civil society organizations. Um, in the first part, institutional strengthening, we have some ex examples, but in general uh, terms, we work with national and local institutions to provide technical assistance to build some tools to respond uh, of, uh, you know, to the crime of trafficking in persons. Tools like, for example, uh, to identify or how to provide assistance. In this case, for example, with the uh, Colombian Institute, Institute of Family Welfare, which is the national institute in charge of the um, assistance and protection of children uh, in all forms of violence, um, we have, for example, more than 10,000 officials from this institute uh, have received technical assistance to strengthen the response to trafficking in persons, especially uh, of, for children and adolescents in regions with significant gaps and in institutional capacity. For example, the region of Orinoco and, and, Amaz and the, the Amazon region. And we have provided two tools, two important tools for the Institute and to strengthen the capacity to identify this, uh, this, this crime and how to respond. The first one is the guide for the identification of an, uh, an, an accompanied migrant children and adolescents at risk of being victims of trafficking in persons. As many of you know, Colombia has, has a lot of land border and it's very difficult for all the immigration authority to have control of all the points in, 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 along or among the land border. So the, cross, the, 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 the children crossing borders is permanent and is so uh, easier for irregular uh, border pass to have uh, this, this entrance to the national territory. And it's important to have the tools to identify where these 
children are in risk of being uh, victims of trafficking in person. And the second one, and I think is, is the most important, it was uh, is the guideline for specialized assistance to children and adolescents victims of trafficking in persons in Colombia. This guideline is, a, uh, is, is, is part of the institutional framework of the Institute of the ICBF, and it's important to recognize that this, this guideline provide all the information, the route, and how to react and to identify when children, uh, one child uh, is victim of trafficking in persons and what kind of assistance is important to provide to, uh, to the child and also to the family. We work with the Ministry of Labor, uh, especially because as we know that uh, the um, trafficking in persons with the purpose of sexual exploitation is the most um, is the principal uh, 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 forms or form of, uh, of exploitation, uh, but we recognize that it's important to uh, identify other forms that, uh, for sure, are happening and are and, and 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 it's a real situation in the country, such as the trafficking in persons with the purpose of forced labor. So we work with the Ministry of Labor, creating mechanism to identify and to refer. It's a referral mechanism for. Uh, victims of trafficking in persons uh, with the purpose of forced labor. And uh, with this referral mechanism, we are not only pretending to activate the prosecution, the prosecution uh, of, the, of the criminals, but also to provide assistance to the victims that uh, the labor inspectors identified in the territory. In the second category, we can, uh, for example, uh, give you some examples, uh, uh, but uh, we love or we like to uh, work directly with the local authorities and other local stakeholders. One of the examples of our work is that uh, the SERF is the Emergency uh, Response Fund that uh, between 2018 and 2019, we jointly with UN Women and the Norwegian Refugee Council and NRC, uh, we work especially pre providing protection of um, uh, people, uh, victims of gender-based violence, trafficking in persons, and sexual exploitation in different uh, levels and in different forms or, of occurrence or manifestation, young and adult, migrant women in Colombia, and women, or national women in this uh, land border or in the border. Uh, we create guidelines for the local referral and assistance in the local level according to the local reality and context. Uh, not uh, One of our experience and our lessons learned is that it's not always a good way to respond to the trafficking in persons only from the national level. Uh, you must respond or it's important to respond from the local level according to the different aspects and the different context in the local level. It's not the same uh, situation in the land border or in the border with some countries than in main cities or in the, in the for example, in cities next to, uh, to the Caribbean or to the, to the Pacific Ocean. It's different, the context, the culture are so different. So the tools and the capacity response must be provided from the local level and attending to the local context. So we also provide supplies to immediate, to immediate and mediate assistance and promote uh, this, uh, the networks uh, and NGOs to how to respond and how to identify this kind of, of violations. Uh, as I mentioned, not only trafficking in persons, but also all forms of sexual exploitation and different forms of uh, gender-based violence. Thank you, Thank you so much, Hilberto. I think you touched on some really important points okay. there about partnerships um, and also about recalling that there is not going to be a one-size-fits-all approach uh, in an anti-trafficking response. Um, I'm really interested um, to maybe have access to the guidelines that uh, Colombia has been producing on how to um, provide specialised assistance. It would be wonderful if we're able to start sharing those. Um, and also for any of the participants on this call, if you are um, developing or if you have already produced special guidelines on responding to trafficking in your context, 
the Global Protection Cluster task team on anti-trafficking would love to receive them um, so we can start to build a repository of information that might be able to assist people in other contexts. I know it's probably one of our biggest challenges, not just in the anti-trafficking world, but in child protection and in GBV, something that's been coming out a lot in, in the annual forum so far, is the need to better share these practices across countries and operations. So it's wonderful to know that some of those resources exist. And please, I really encourage you to either email the task team or add it in the chat. Um, so we can share it with the participants live now. Um, I will now hand over the floor uh, to Irina from IOM, who will take us through uh, how the IOM Ukraine office has collected data on anti-trafficking to inform their response in the crisis context. Over to you. Thank you so much, Sam. Uh, so. I, I would like today to present to you our knowledge-based approach to protection and prevention in the context of the armed conflict in Ukraine. And actually, uh, by listening to, um, I can not control it. Um, I just want to go to you. Uh -huh. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, so, uh, actually, by listening to other speakers, I found out that we uh, were quite lucky to have a very strong counter trafficking program uh, before uh, the conflict started in 2014. And we actually, here in Ukraine, uh, we built our area counter trafficking interventions. They are evidence based and data driven, and we built them by analyzing the patterns in recruitment and exploitation. Which gather through our beauty caseload and combine them with the data gathered through qualitative and quantitative surveys. This collected data and knowledge are further translated into practical action and they are made available to practitioners working in the counter trafficking field. And today uh, I want to present you the results of the survey that we conducted last year uh, and we wanted to with it, we wanted to actually find out what are the patterns of human trafficking, the matter the next one, probably. Uh -huh, thank you. What are the patterns of human trafficking in the context of armed conflicts and what factors increase the risk of human trafficking? So the survey de um, design was the qualitative and exploratory and we had some study limitations as the survey was not conducted on non-governmental controlled areas and the victims of trafficking and populations vulnerable to human trafficking, they were selected mainly through NGOs providing services to them which might have had some impact on uh, the survey results. Next. So the survey, uh, we started from conducting the desk survey. We gathered information by analyzing characteristics of human trafficking and counter trafficking activities in eight countries where armed conflict took place since 2008. Then we organized focus group with uh, experts, we organized seven focus groups overall with participants representing governmental authorities and international and non-governmental organizations. And after that, we conducted semi-structured interviews with two different groups of participants. The first one was victims of trafficking. And uh, it should be noted here that these were people who were actually exploited after the conflict was started. So actually from 2014 to 2018. And then we conducted semi-structured interviews with people at high risk of getting into the situation of human trafficking. Next. So as a result of the survey, what was really interesting for us is the fact that uh, the risk of getting into the situation of human trafficking is actually driven by a set of different interrelated factors, which are economic because difficult financial situation and the fact that people suffered from the armed conflict and they had to move to other localities, it influenced a lot the fact that they were ready to accept a lot of risky job offers. Then social uh, factors, because they didn't have documents, a lot of them didn't have access to different resources which were provided earlier. And of course, safety and protection concerns, because the fear for their personal safety uh, made, made them 
uh, moving to other places of residence, uh, separating from their families and made them more vulnerable to human trafficking. Next. And when we look at the patterns of human trafficking, then we can see that the recruitment was mainly done through acquaintances. So we analyze here only those cases uh, when it were, uh, they were related to the human trafficking. So they were mainly recruited through acquaintances. They were transported independently by public transport and paying for their tickets with their own money. Uh, there were labor cases of exploitation mostly, and it correlates a lot to the situation that we generally have here in Ukraine, because 93% of cases are cases of labor exploitation. Uh, people were mostly exploited in construction, agriculture, and vegetable factories. The main countries of exploitation were Russian Federation, then Poland goes, and what is interesting is that exploitation actually took place on non-government controlled areas. And people were mainly released by employers or escaped. Next. But what was challenging for us when we received those results is that we find out that people started looking for some assistance after from one to three years after actual release from exploitation. And it gives this uh, understanding why for example, when any conflict started or any crisis started, you will not see the immensely increase in the number of identified victims of trafficking right after the conflict, but it actually appears to become within one, two or three years. Uh, people got to know about the possibility of the previous one, sorry, people got to know about the possibility of um, the um, assistance from their local media, from their acquaintances, from the police, and Mostly, they needed medical examination, tools for self-employment, and assistance with the development of their own business. And actually, for the 20 years of the IBM working in this field and providing direct assistance to victims of trafficking, we've assisted more than 70,000 people so far. And of them, like um, this year, we started when we got the results of this survey, we started uh, building our counter trafficking response not only directly around victims of trafficking, but also among those people at high risk of trafficking, which is extremely important, especially in times of humanitarian crisis and in humanitarian settings. Next, please. So this year in summer, we've included this uh, counter trafficking response into IUN Global Strategic Preparedness and Response Plan. And uh, during summer, we've assisted 188 people already. And as you can see from the disaggregation, 18% were victims of trafficking, 44% were individuals at high risk of trafficking, 32% were conflict affected population, especially people suffering from domestic violence mainly, and 6% were migrants who returned to Ukraine due to COVID. And these were mainly labor migrants who are now actively looking for other job offers and other employment opportunities. Next. Um, so when we're having, um, when we're looking at these people, we should understand that every beneficiary out of these almost two countries, they receive uh, reinstallation grants, cash grants for food, hygiene items, and other essential. Uh, almost 40% of them receive professional equipment, family assistance. Uh, 33, 23% covered their housing needs. And it is important to understand that when we're looking at this person and when we're talking this needs based, when we're providing this needs based assistance to them, a person is entitled to different types of assistance. So uh, we were not seeing like, let's say if you are having professional equipment, then you are not eligible for medical treatment. But we're not limiting this anyway. So this is a very client oriented approach that we're using. And when we're talking about the lessons learned on identification, it is very important when you're working, especially in humanitarian settings, to strictly adhere to the main humanitarian principles of humanity, neutrality, impartiality, and independence. Because uh, during identification and provision of assistance near the conflict line, additional pressure is put uh, on humanitarian actors for them to identify people irrespective of their political beliefs. 
that is very important to maintain confidentiality and therefore all the information is kept at the end because otherwise it may put in additional risk people who are being along the contact line. It is very uh, important to engage members from the local community in identification and to build trust. And here, when we're talking about the local community, we mean non-governmental uh, organizations, we mean governmental structures, state employment services, state social services. And uh, we've identified the new vulnerable groups, civilians who were held in captivity for the purpose of exploitation. And they were, it was quite challenging for us and very interesting to work with these groups. When we're talking about the lessons learned on provision of assistance, the cash assistance to cover basic needs is very essential because it, um, with these, we gain trust from beneficiaries well, and, uh, and it's uh, some tangible assistance that can be provided over a very short period of time. The most pressing needs of the beneficiaries are professional equipment, family assistance and housing. And it is extremely important uh, to ensure individual approach when providing assistance, basing this approach and basing this assistance on the every victim's need, like not uh, giving the unified assistance to all beneficiaries mm -hmm. on the contact line or in the secretary sectors. And when we're talking about the prevention, because at the very beginning I, I told you that these uh, research provided us very nice grounds both for protection and prevention. Within the humanitarian settings, we try to use this overall IUM Ukraine's comprehensive approach to human trafficking prevention. Starting from general awareness raising about human trafficking, where we give uh, people information about the fact that human trafficking still exists in the 21st century and that it can be connected to them and it can, can concern them, to targeted prevention of human trafficking when we are providing them information, no, the previous one, sorry, uh, targeted prevention of human trafficking, when we are providing them information about the basic safety rules based on the target audience, and then to the early prevention of human trafficking when we want to change uh, their behavior practice. So when we're talking about the general awareness raising about human trafficking, here the main goal is to give people understanding that human trafficking can be related to them and to their families. And here Thank we're you. not wanting to change. I, sorry to interrupt you, I'm really sorry. Uh, but we are really running out of time. We only have 10 minutes left on our session. And we are still, we'll have to hear from Ms. Diana and um, then we'll have some concluding words from Sam. I think this was really, really interesting and, you know, learning more about the different aspects of the anti-trafficking response in, in Ukraine. And I think for all of us as humanitarian practitioners, one of the things that we should think is that we already collect a lot of data through protection monitoring and other assessments that we can use uh, and analyze from an anti-trafficking perspective. Um, so without further ado, I want to hand the floor to Estiana. Estiana, no tenemos mucho tiempo, así que te pido, por favor, solo 10 minutos a punto, ¿sí? Buenos días a todas y a todos. Mi nombre es Estiana Colmenares. Soy la directora ejecutiva de la organización Voces de Género Venezuela y el día de hoy represento a mujeres y hombres de distintas organizaciones nacionales e internacionales que en nuestro país han trabajado en materia de trata. Eh, en este momento no veo mi presentación, Cristina. Ok, gracias. Eh, avancemos, por favor. En nuestro país existe eh, un marco jurídico referente a la trata y el tráfico de personas, el cual tiene como eh, base fundamental la Constitución de la República Bolivariana de Venezuela. Sobre ella se han desarrollado una cantidad de leyes orgánicas en materia de protección de niños, niñas y adolescentes, en materia de protección de mujeres a una vida libre de violencia contra la delincuencia organizada, migración y extranjería. Adelante, Cristina. Igualmente, tenemos en Venezuela, dentro del ordenamiento jurídico, distintas eh, sentencias emanadas de la Sala Constitucional del Tribunal Supremo de Justicia 
No obstante, todo esto tiene su eh, referencia y su basamento sobre el marco institucional sobre el cual se debe desarrollar todo este ordenamiento jurídico a través de los distintos ministerios, a través de los órganos administrativos, judiciales y jurisdiccionales de la República de Venezuela. Adelante, Cristina. Dentro del marco institucional, eh, obviamente encontramos, como acabo de decir, todo lo que contempla el sistema administrativo, los órganos administrativos, como son los consejos de protección, el ministerio público, como órgano de investigación y el poder judicial. Cabe destacar que el ordenamiento jurídico venezolano contempla dentro de la ley orgánica sobre el derecho de la mujer a una vida libre y trata de mujeres, niñas y por una jurisdicción especial en materia de delitos de violencia contra las mujeres y tribunales especiales en esta materia. Adelante, Cristina. ¿Cuál es el contexto venezolano? En Venezuela, en los últimos cinco años, Venezuela ha pasado a ser un país considerado receptor a un país emisor de personas que salen buscando oportunidades de trabajo y nuevos horizontes. Actualmente en Venezuela observamos y tenemos las cifras más altas de personas en movilidad humana que por diversas razones dejan el país. Hemos observado como desplazamientos masivos a través de las fronteras terrestres hacia diversos destinos que frecuentemente no eran este, destinos para la población venezolana. Todo esto ha implicado que muchas personas deban hacer largas esperas a la interperie en las rutas elegidas para ir y migrar hacia otros países, lo cual tiene su fundamento en el deterioro de la calidad de vida, la escasez de alimentos, de medicamentos, colapsos de servicios, estableciendo todo esto factores que llevan eh, a muchas personas, especialmente a las más jóvenes, a migrar. Aun cuando en Venezuela tenemos avances en el marco legal en materia de trata y tráfico de personas, los problemas políticos, económicos y sociales que existen en nuestro país hacen que estos temas pasen desapercibidos, por lo cual existe un gran número de mujeres venezolanas migrantes que son captadas fuera y dentro de Venezuela. Existe eh, la trata con fines de explotación laboral, sobre todo en mujeres muy jóvenes, las cuales son trasladadas a otros países con el objeto de eh, trabajar como servidumbre. Existe una explotación sexual y trata de niños y niñas usados para la mendicidad trabajo de condiciones eh, como nuevas formas de esclavitud. E igualmente observamos que esta situación de la trata y tráfico de personas, además de las mujeres, niñas y adolescentes, afecta la captación de mujeres trans. Cabe resaltar en este punto particular, de acuerdo a un estudio realizado por la organización Unión Afirmativa, que no existen eh, lineamientos que permitan resguardar los derechos de estas personas. En cuanto a la asistencia de los sobrevivientes, debemos decir que identificar a los sobrevivientes en Venezuela es un verdadero desafío, pues a pesar del ordenamiento jurídico, a pesar de toda la normativa existente, la atención integral a las personas sobrevivientes en Venezuela se hace cuesta arriba. ¿A qué se debe esto? que cuando las personas acuden a las instancias del Estado venezolano a realizar sus denuncias, son revictimizadas, son culpabilizadas. En nuestro país, protocolos específicos para la atención de las víctimas y de sus familiares. Por lo tanto, la asistencia es muy limitada. Esto se agrava por la profunda crisis que atraviesa Venezuela, lo cual ha debilitado la institucionalidad, siendo la respuesta actualmente la que proviene de las organizaciones de derechos humanos, las organizaciones internacionales, de todas aquellas organizaciones que pertenecemos a la arquitectura humanitaria, lo cual se debilita por la falta de recursos financieros. ¿Qué 
tipo de asistencia buscan las personas? Las víctimas, los sobrevivientes de trata y acompañamiento realizan las ONG. Observamos que se realizan talleres preventivos en las diferentes comunidades. El Estado, a través de las remisiones que hace en algunos casos eh, a los órganos policiales cuando se toman las denuncias, simplemente en muchos, eh, en una gran cantidad, no se brinda la protección de vida, vulnerando el debido proceso, la tutela judicial efectiva y dejando en un estado de abandono jurídico a las personas víctimas de este flagelo. De acuerdo a un estudio realizado por la organización Exo Venezuela, tenemos que en, en en nuestro país, el 68% de nuestras víctimas son mujeres. Y de ese 68%, el 42% tiene entre 18 y 30 años. Las causas que han fundamentado esta situación es por el aumento de la movilidad, las redes de prostitución forzada. En los casos que hemos identificado, hemos observado que principalmente se reportan a través de los estados fronterizos. La gran mayoría de la población venezolana está saliendo de nuestro país a través de las llamadas trochas por las fronteras Colombo-Venezolana y la frontera con Brasil. Vía marítima salen desde el estado de La Guaira hacia Trinidad y Tobago y Curazao. ¿Qué lecciones hemos aprendido de esto? Requerimos de una respuesta integral, holística, es decir, una respuesta donde brindemos a las víctimas atención médica, psicológica, legal, social. Es necesario trabajar de manera articulada con todos los actores que forman parte del sistema rector de protección integral. Debemos construir alianzas con otros países para dar acompañamiento a las sobrevivientes de explotación sexual. Y necesitamos los mecanismos necesarios para documentar los casos de trata y tráfico. Grazie Estiana. Grazie uh, Estiana. Perdon, eh, che tengo che ti interromper perché eh, tenemo che terminare il... Già sono le quattro e media. Um, e mil disculpas. Um, so, this is it. I think we've come towards the end of our session. I think Sam wants to say a couple of share some thoughts of all the things we've learned from the different presenters today and some reflections from our side. The floor is yours, Sam. Thank you so much to all of the panelists. I'm, it's fantastic to hear about the work that's being done uh, and some of the achievements uh, that have been made in really challenging contexts. Uh, when it sounds like resources are extremely stretched um, and still the need for more specialised services uh, is really clear. I think some things I really took away from this is that not everyone needs to be an expert on anti-trafficking, but all humanitarian actors need to know the basics, the basic functions of what trafficking is and how to identify a person and refer them to those specialised services where they exist. I think what we heard a lot is that there are NGOs active or there are government task forces active. And so the important thing for us to consider in a response is then how do we work with what exists? How do we bolster what already exists? And I think what's wonderful is sometimes humanitarians say, we don't know anything about trafficking, there's nothing that exists in this country. But what we've heard in each of these four contexts is absolutely that yes, there are things that do exist. Uh, I think as William said at the beginning that sometimes there is a tendency to still work in silos and that we don't actually stand a chance of truly combating trafficking in crisis contexts. 
without breaking down some of those silos and without better coordinating our response with NGOs, with humanitarian partners, with the government, uh, with peace and security actors. Um, I think something we heard was that we need strong protection from the outset um, and strong prevention from the outset. But we also heard that victims might not be identified until years into a crisis. And I think that's really important for us to consider when we plan responses, that we need that dual target there to make sure that we have those referral mechanisms and services in place from the outset, but know that it might be some time uh, until those victims begin to come forward. And I think a really important thing we heard as well is that 100% of victims in the Ukrainian context required immediate cash assistance. And so that's something we should really consider going forward in our anti-trafficking responses. I think one thing that I really took away from Lily's presentation is the importance of winning champions, that ultimately uh, all of our work just requires us, um, our energy as humans and as colleagues. Um, so investing in each other um, and what we can provide together is ultimately how we're going to improve the response. Uh, Unfortunately, there isn't any time, um, and we've already run over time for a dedicated question and answer time with our panellists. But the, the great thing is, is the Global Protection Cluster has just revamped its online community of practice. So that is a channel that we can all log into, just go to the Global Protection Cluster website and we can continue the conversation on there about responding to anti-trafficking. That's it from me and they, they're my reflections at the moment. Renata, did, was there anything you wanted to add? No, I think you spoke perfectly for the <laughs> two of us. I want to thank all of our panelists I am so sorry that I interrupted you, but I really look forward for us to continue this conversation at the community of practice. And I also look forward to getting in touch with you soon for the guidance launch, which is going to be launched in English, Spanish, and uh, French. French and Arabic. Oh, yes, my goodness. Exactly. We're covering everything. Exactly. So please do write to us. You have Sam's contact or you can just write to gpc at unhcr.org. And that's it from us. Thank thanks you very so much. Thanks so much, panelists, and thanks for attending.